Hello, welcome to VR Roundtable, episode 69. My name is Gary and joining me is Steve and Chris. Um, unfortunately, Anthony is unable to join us this week. Um, he's a little bit busy working on his website and his channel, uh, VR Game Rankings. So definitely go over and check that out if you get a chance. Um, also, we just wanted to mention, because last week we had Epix uh, on the show, it's, he's, it was Epix 911, now it's Epix VR. Um, definitely check his channel out. He um, joined us and we did have a very, very positive response from having Epix on the show. Um, and we just want to make it clear, you know, we'll definitely be having him back on as a guest um, at some point, you know, hopefully not too long in the future. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, but anyway, we've got a few new stories to go through this week and a few games so we can get straight into it. Um, the first one we wanted to talk about, and this is coming out of Tested, um, they had a video on their projection series about where they had a hands-on with the Vive Pro. Um, and this was really, really interesting because test the Tested guys, obviously, you know, they have... Um, so the, the the expertise and the knowledge and also the contacts in order to get access to this kind of stuff and give give um, hands on impressions, which are very, very valuable to consumers that are looking to buy this kind of stuff. Um, but within this video, they went through a few things and we'll go through these one by one. Um, the first one I wanted to talk about is the resolution, which is probably the most important part of the Vive Pro for people that are upgrading. And Norm took a photo through the lenses of the Vive Pro and also the original vibe just to do like a comparison between the two um, and it gives some um, interesting results i thought um it looked pretty like it, it looked like a, a, an upgrade there was definitely an upgrade in there i guess it's just how how significant that is when you're looking at it on a screen and how significant it is in a headset it's difficult to to work out at this stage um chris what did you think of this uh yeah i think it it definitely is a a major improvement um, Steve, do you have like the side by side up on the the screen? Yep, I got it for up. people. Okay, cool. Um, just kind of looking at it, uh, real blown up. I feel like I can't even read the text on like the left side, uh, which is the original Vive, really that well. And then on the Vive Pro, it's all easy to read. So I think that's definitely kind of signifies the difference there. But you know, as we know, it's not like a big leap or anything. Uh, it's it's definitely a minor improvement, but. I'm just really more interested to find out how this affects, you know, games with textures and the textures being far away, just kind of having more clarity. But just based on this, I think it's, you know, it's promising. It's nothing we haven't seen before or like haven't already known, but it's nice to just have the actual Vibe Pro rather than the Samsung Odyssey. Because I think until then, or since uh, this video, we only had kind of a comparison of the Odyssey versus the Vibe, whereas this is the actual Vibe Pro uh, screen. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think the test is is somewhat inherently flawed. Like, and I'm not trying to discredit them at all because uh, hopefully, if I was in that situation, I would have done something similar. At least had enough sense to. Uh, but it is a person holding a cell phone up to, to grab the image, and there's a lot of things, you know, depending on the 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 amount of light and everything. You know, cell phones can can do a longer exposure. But that being said, I think it does accurately convey the idea. Now, I've not used the Vive Pro myself yet, uh, but I have used uh, some of the MR headset. Well, one of the MR headsets and it is a higher resolution not quite as high as the Vive Pro uh, but what I'm seeing in this in this comparison does sort of to a degree reflect what I remember seeing you know in, in going between my, um, my my Vive and, and the uh, MR headset so I think I think what they're trying to show is, is, is sort of convey an idea I, you know this isn't something that you'd want Eurogamer or somebody like that going through and pixel counting and trying to compare in that way because it, it is just a picture through one lens of through another lens of the headset so so it's not it's not intended to 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 be completely uh, uh, to be a complete comparison in that sense but I think it does convey the general gist and uh, I think I think it, everyone is going to appreciate the improvements that the resolution makes um, but I also at the same time and I think I said this when we discussed it um, at CES when the Vipro was was announced is I think you you when you put that Vipro headset on for the first time I don't think your socks are going to be necessarily blown away by the resolution increase uh, at, at that moment you're gonna have all sorts of sensory you know is it more comfortable you're gonna be comparing all these things uh, and the resolution is gonna look better but what I think you would notice more and, and again, this is just my experience, is when you take that headset off and put a lower res headset on, I think you're going to feel the, the downstep 
in, in resolution more than you feel that initial step up. Uh, but, I, but either way, this is, this is what, what we want to see, and, and the resolution improvement is definitely um, uh, wanted. Yeah, they seem to focus a lot as well on the fact that the text um, is more noticeable than anything else. The fact that you, that you have readable text with this uh, step up in resolution, which is always good. Um, playing games like Elite Dangerous, for example, where the, the, playing it originally on the Vive, there was a, sort of a, a little bit of a problem um, in the way that particular game was rendered. The text wasn't particularly clear. Um, and, you know, you're constantly wanting these things, especially in a game like that, that I play a lot. You want the this these particular things to be clear. And as Chris was saying, you know, things like for me, when I'm playing games like Fallout 4 or Skyrim with these huge vistas and that kind of stuff where you're looking at things in the distance, even racing games, Project Cars, for example, you're constantly looking in the distance with those. So if you can play some, uh, have an increase in resolution with that um at those points then i think that that would be great um we'll have to see because i don't know how much of a difference this is and i take your point steve you know going back it might not appear a significant upgrade until you then go back to an older headset or something like that and then you really do appreciate what they're doing on top of that there um Okay, the other thing um, on this testing video that came out, and it's a little bit concerning for me, is Jeremy mentioned the fact that um, the God Ray seemed a little bit more pronounced in the Vive Pro. And he put this down to the fact that um, because the resolution is higher, the screen seems slightly brighter and everything seems more accentuated, including the God Rays. So from the Fresnel lenses, you have these uh, concentric circles, which are sort of reflect the light out and it does it is a distraction um and this is one of the main things for me which um i find in the current generation of headsets the the rift and the vive um the most distracting when i'm trying to get immersed within an experience um and it's especially so since i've got a psvr where this isn't so much of a problem i really do like like the fact that you don't have those on the psvr quite so much or even at all really um so i was hoping that that would be slightly different in this vive pro um, what do, what do you guys think? Well, you know, like I think Jeremy and and I remember when they did their video on the Pimax. I think he kind of sort of focused on lenses, and, and for whatever reasons, that must be something that that uh, I guess in VR distracts him more, and he pays attention to it, which is great for me because I also focus on lenses. Um, as everyone can see, I'm wearing glasses. I've talked about wearing glasses in the past. I have an astigmatism. I cannot wear contacts. I would need a, a sort of a procedure that isn't LASIK um, that would, would get me away from glasses, and, I, and I'm not making that jump just yet. Um, so what I think happens, just speaking personally, is that any god ray or any uh, light blooming effect is sort of uh, magnified for me. Like it's going through my glasses and getting it even more. Uh, so I really, really, really appreciate a, a reduced god ray effect or just artifacting as a whole. And even before VR, when I was playing uh, standard games, I hate a, a light blooming effect. And seems seems like a lot of games do that. Like the industry as a whole likes it, but I, I personally can't stand it. So I hate I hate the god rays or the ghosting on the on the rift. I hate the the concentric rings and and the artifacts uh, on the vibe. So uh, it is a little um, you know I don't, I don't want to say frustrating because I almost understand what they were doing with the Pi Pro, but uh, I wished they would have taken this opportunity to do something else. And on the uh, promo video, when, when the Vive Pro was launched, um, there was some text that popped up and it said uh, uh, improved lenses or uh, state-of-the-art lenses. It said something on that video, and I'll go back and try to remember to put it in the description of this show, uh, to the, the exact phrasing. But in that promo video by HTC, they, they hinted towards there being some sort of uh, change in the lenses and 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 from as far as what we know uh, what people were saying out of CES and now what, what Jeremy and Norm are saying there doesn't appear to be a change now perhaps there was and, and, and maybe the change is subtle and that you can't just tell with a naked test a naked eye test um, but at the same time it's like damn it like you know I really wish they would have taken the opportunity to uh, sort of rectify that issue yeah uh Go, go ahead, Chris. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, it, on their promo video, it says enhanced optics. And I feel like that's kind of like, basically, that's just a lie, I think. It seems like that they're the exact same uh, lenses as before, which I feel like is just stupid because that's really the 
thing that could make the most difference in kind of making something better than the existing Vive or existing Rift, like just any improvements in optics, you know, like we know the Oculus Go is going to have second gen optics. I think that's really one of the easiest things to kind of put R&D into and actually make better. So that's a little bit disappointing for me since I'll probably be getting a Vive Pro, but uh, it is what it is, I guess. Like, I'm, I'm. They don't bother me as much as they bother you, Steve. But, you know, it's never ideal. Yeah. Okay. Just a, a couple of other quick points I want to uh, get through. And um, this was with this tested video. They did um, sort of confirm that the Vive ones, the new Vive ones that will be accompanying this as a bundle later on in the year, um, are basically the same form factor as the original Vive ones. They um, look exactly the same, although they've they've got some colour in. I think they've got some blue on there as well. But other than that, they're they're exactly the same. But they do contain updated sensors, so they're compatible with the uh, base station two. Point oh, um, so that's um, interesting. You know, there don't, doesn't seem to be anything other than the fact that they've got the um, the these extra these updated sensors in there. So, um, and also on the headphones. This was a, a bigger point than I ever thought it would be. Um, but on a video we did when the Vive Pro was first announced, um, one of us, I think it, I don't know exactly who, but I think. Um, one of us said that the headphones can't be removed and the rest of us went along with that. And I didn't know at that time specifically because there was a lot of reporting that was con contradicting um, each other when we recorded that show. But um, we, the information was available. Had we looked for it hard enough, I'm sure we could have found it, but we didn't really realize that it was going to be such a big point of contention from, for people that watched that video. Um, but anyway, the headphones for the Vipro can be removed. They need to be unscrewed. Um, and then they, you can remove them and use your own headphones in there. Um, but yeah, on those two points, Steve, what do you think well the um you know it was it was credible information it wasn't me that said it but it was um i, I think it was either upload or row two had a, an article that they they uh edited twice like initially they said they were removable they went back in edited the article and said that they weren't removable and then went back in days later and edited a third time or a second time to say that yes they they were removable so i think htc wasn't very clear uh those that day or two or so after uh revealing the vive pro on whether or not they're removable and we still haven't seen what that removal looks like and you, if you look at the headset it kind of protrudes a lot like right in that that headband area where the where the headphones attach and exactly where is it removable and i almost wonder if even though it's technically removable is it going to be a situation where people can freely use a a wide range of, of over-the-ear headphones it's kind of like the playstation vr like it's got that thick headband and it makes it difficult like I can't use these Sony Golds that I'm wearing right now. I can't use those on the PlayStation VR uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, it's too thick around the headband. And I almost wonder if the Vive Pro is going to be a little bit like that. Uh, earbuds are obviously you can definitely wear those without issue on on any headset. So um, I, I think yeah, it's technically removable, but I think it remains to seen remains to see just how much that that's going to be usable to the consumer. Uh, your other point on the controllers. Um, it's a little bit of a bummer. They didn't make they they didn't take it an opportunity, sort of like the lenses, to make any improvement there. Like they're just kind of making the same ones, throwing the updated uh, 2.0 sensors on it, and giving it a blue coat of paint and calling it a day. Um, it goes back to that whole idea of where they may be hoping Knuckles would be available. And I know Knuckles is a Valve product, uh, but right now there's no other Steam VR headset. You know marketed and produced in this way if valve were to release the knuckles they would either have to sell it themselves or ideally it would be coming through htc uh so i i don't know i, I it goes back and and i'll quit rambling here after i make this last point is jeremy and norm i think they both but i think jeremy accented more on this particular video he said this five pro is is there'll be a lot of consumers that want it the the, the hardcore dedicated uh high-end consumer will want it but they said that part of this focus from htc was to give it to manufacturers you know like, like bmw i think they use bmw as an example like the 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 car design the, the person at bmw or the team at bmw that's designing the shape of the car the fender panels you know the whole contour like like they want a a better headset you know to to, to look at the models and and things like that so he he kind of said that maybe they were pushing the vibe pro as a as a as a sort of an enterprise or an industrial type uh uh, uh 
emphasis, not just consumers. And, and, and this would support that, the fact that they really it's just a higher res Vive with Steam tracking 2.0. Yeah, they, they, um, some of the language that um, Daniel O'Brien was um, talking when, when, when they were announcing this Vibe Pro at that, that conference just before CES, um, the language he was using made me think, you know, this is not really aimed. I mean, I guess they can sell it to consumers and there will be a lot of consumers and enthusiasts that will be picking this thing up. But the language he was using really wasn't focusing in on that at all. And it seemed to me like he was making a point of saying that as well, um, aim, aiming more at the sort of the industry professionals kind of market. Um, as you say, you know, the they've worked a lot with these car manufacturers in order to demonstrate cars so you can look around, take a virtual tour of these cars and that kind of stuff um and it, it does point to that i don't know whether they're moving overall in that kind of direction or if that's just sort of something they want to push with the, this particular model of the vibe five um but yeah it's an interesting point chris you know you're i think you've said that you will be picking up a vive pro um what do you think of these headphones the fact that they'll be removable will you be doing that or do you think you'll stick with the ones that are included yeah, I don't I don't know why people care about that too much. Like as long as the headphones are decent like the Rift, no one's going to want to remove them. Like do you ever see anyone with a Rift with their headphones removed? Like I guess in the beginning people were. Like I remember when they first came out people were like, "Ooh, I can remove them and put my own." But no one does that. It's just so easy to have the headphones there already that I think that's not really that big of a deal. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of disappointed with the controllers. I mean, I did say, I think last week or the week before that, like, it looked like the controllers are just blue and they're the same. So I guess that's just kind of confirmed now that they're the same. But I mean, to your point, it makes sense that it's just an industrial product, but I just feel like they could have marketed it more as that, like calling it the Vive Pro makes consumers want it. Whereas like calling it a Vive Enterprise Edition or something or uh, like renewing the enterprise edition vibe that already exists would have kind of made it more enterprise but i guess htc just wants all the money so it's fine they just they just want to make sure anyone would buy it who wants it but yeah i mean it's it's disappointing but i guess it's to be expected that if it's for enterprise primarily um that the controllers are the same yeah i guess, I guess they'll they'll just play it by ear you know they're, they're not going to not sell it to people if people want to buy it so they're sort of hedging their bets in some ways i think they are sort of aiming it towards industry but a lot of consumers you know enthusiast first adopters will be picking this thing up and it could um sort of cement val uh vive as being sort of the uh the the best high-end vr if you do want to go in for the the absolute high-end consumer level vr that's the one you need to get and um it could it could work well for them um we'll see how it goes the last couple of points on this are the um so from this tested video again it was the fact that it seems to have a single connection to the headset now rather than having the three and one cable where you have independent connection so you have a hdmr connection a usb and a power connection now it's all integrated into one single connection and one single cable going to the breakout box um then from the new breakout box you do have three further connections going to the pc as usual you know it's, it, it connects in pretty much the same way i believe um so that's all interesting stuff but um the final thing is the fact that these dual cameras now they didn't really go in too much uh, in the video on tested because they didn't they weren't really given any answers on what these cameras are going to be used for i mean i think we can make best guesses it's going to be sort of a pass through um in a similar way to how we had on the original vi for to sort of complement the, the chaperone system so you can sort of use it to view your play space and that kind of stuff um however there was this engadget article where they had an interview with uh, htc vibes vice president raymond powell and he was talking about in that article where they could use these cameras potentially for sort of basic hand tracking he did say that there was going to be a sort of a, th these were very low resolution cameras similar to how they were in the original vive but there's two of them um so they can use them for basic hand tracking and that's interesting, even if they can get to a point where it's 
kind of like how do you remember that uh, keyboard that was announced a, a few months ago where they said that they can overlay the vive camera so you can actually just see your fingers operating on this uh, trapped keyboard so even if they can get that kind of functionality with this so you can use something like with a slightly wider field of view so you can use something like a hotas or a steering wheel just so you can see your hands within the vr play space and overlay them within the vr world i think that would be great um, but if they can do something even beyond that where there is interaction kind of like a magic uh sorry not magic leap, leap motion uh kind of integration with this i would love something like that to be built into these headsets i think that's that's really valuable um chris have you got any thoughts on that i i think that they're just kind of thrown out all these things that could happen and they actually don't have anything working i mean that's guess that's obvious since there's no demo or anything um i feel like two cameras really it does isn't enough information for good hand tracking but like you said it is possible that they could maybe make it so you could just see where your hands are and not necessarily interact. I think that could be totally something that's possible. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Also in this article, they said like when we first designed the camera, we wanted to use it to enhance chaperone and let it detect boundaries more automatically and more accurate, accurately. So like, I don't know, maybe it'll finally be able to actually figure out where the walls are because i know like that was originally what they kind of wanted with the one camera but there's no depth that you can get from that at least with the when there's stereo cameras they can try to triangulate where stuff is so that would be cool i remember like when the camera first came out wasn't there rumors of like if the dog comes in the play space it'll know that and all this stuff so i just hope that um they'll be able to build in some of this functionality that we've always kind of wanted with the cameras but then just ended up turning them off because they never worked right <laughs> they always broke tracking for me at least well, I think what they're doing is is they are looking to put it out there, give the hardware and hope that developers take advantage of it. Hope that I don't think they, HTC, are going to do much with it. I don't believe that necessarily that Valve is going to do much with it because, you know, Valve is focused on on more of the, the wide headset support as opposed to just doing things specifically for the HTC Vive. Um, so I, I think it I think it doesn't hurt. I think it's interesting that they chose to to spend some money to keep not only keep a camera in the headset at all, but to, to add a second one. Uh, I'm intrigued by it. I don't have a lot of confidence that it's going to be widely utilized. I thought it was a good idea with the original Vive and and I tinkered with it when I first got my Vive and thought it was neat. But like most people, I went ahead and disabled it so that it wouldn't saturate the USB uh, bandwidth. Um, and, you know, I kind of never really used it beyond that. So if they can come up with good utility, if a developer can, can come up with good utility, if Valve uh, bakes a good utility into OpenVR for it, um, then, then, then I'm excited for that because I think, I think there's opportunity. Uh, I just don't know if it can be realized. Uh, but going back, I wanted to actually talk about that singular case. Um, right now, if with if you have a, a original Vive, and if you some reason lose your link box or your link box fails, um, you can just plug the HDMI cables and the and and things. Um, you know, you can get a power adapter. I know I've read people that have done that to get power supplied to it. Uh, whereas with this new link, this new the, the Vive Pro, like you have to have a link box. Period. Like I, that connector, I don't think is going to really. You know, unless someone makes some sort of adapter, it's not it's not a standard connector. I don't have USB C myself, so I'm not as familiar with what USB C looks like. But I don't think it's a standard USB C connector, is it? No, it's not. No, it's um, it's it's a, like a proprietary cable, I believe, that so, they've designed. But... So, that, so that's an interesting idea for me in the sense that it now makes the link box required. And again, it's probably going to come with the headset, even when you buy the headset only, it obviously has to come with it. So it's not something that requires a kit. Uh, but I think that's interesting in the, in the event that if, if your link box fails, your, your whole HMD is, is rendered unusable. Yeah, it's interesting also just for the wireless adapter, because looking at it, it never had this type of connector on it. So I'm wondering if they're going to have to ship a cable that converts the the regular Vive into the three separate things again for the, the wireless adapter or something. It's very strange. I kind of wish they could figure out how to make it more standardized. Like even if it was a type C connector that could do power and HDMI, like all that stuff's possible today. So it's weird that it's this really tiny preparatory one way thing. I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know why it isn't just power over USB like like all the other headsets. Like I don't, there isn't a separate power feed for the PlayStation VR and the Rift. And, and the only thing I conclude, the Vive is by far the brightest. So, so the, um, you know, I'm assuming the Vive Pro will remain, retain a sort of similar brightness, but maybe that, that, that backlighting or whatever they're doing to get that higher brightest requires a higher level of power. 
I think part of it as well, because they do have in the original Vive, they have the uh, USB, the, the like the um, USB slot in there that you can add extra peripherals in, like the Leap Motion, for example. So I guess that's what they were really trying to use that power cable for. I'm sure they could get it working without uh, an extra power source within there, but then they wouldn't have that um, extra functionality. Although that really wasn't used a great deal. I mean, you had these um, these things like um, the the fans and that kind of stuff yeah, that people were say. using. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I guess it was all to do with that. Um, but yeah, I think there's compromise, isn't there, with, with this cable. Having a single cable, it's, it's better in some ways because I guess presumably it will be lighter it'll be less intrusive than the three-in-one cable but then yeah like you say chris it's not standardized and steve you know it, we'll, we won't be able to easily replace this thing um so you, you you're up against all of these obstacles as well it's all compromises that, that htc have, have decided to go forward with this but again just on that final point of the USB-C there is no reason why they couldn't eventually move towards that kind of uh, standard I think that would be the the way forward in the long term and um, I'd, I'd love to see that although maybe by then we'll all be wireless anyway so it won't matter <laughs> um, okay so that's pretty much all we've got on the Vibe Pro from the tested video so uh, thanks a lot for tested for uh, doing that because we've uh, just covered pretty much what what you went through on there but it's just our, our impressions of it it's always good you know tested i i absolutely love their their channel and they do go into all the things that i want to ask these people and they they sort of cover all these these little points that i uh, i'm interested in so i'm glad they're out there um a couple of smaller news stories i won't stay on these too long uh, the first one is a at the sundance festival there was this vr um I, th I believe it's a 360 video, but it's by Darren Aronofsky and it's called Spheres. And this is the first part of what will be a series of 360 films that he's developing. Um, and it actually landed a seven figure deal at the Sundance Festival. So this is the largest ever known deal for a, uh, a VR focused project, which is um, sort of in really encouraging the fact that it obviously um caught people's attention to this extent um and you know it's got some big names in it darren aronofsky um is a big director so it's, it's all it's all good news for vr um has anybody got any thoughts they want to mention on this one at all i don't know i think it's just good for the the vr film industry that this type of stuff is starting to happen because i know like anyone who wants to make a vr film usually has like no funding and has to kind of do it themselves or have a company that was already doing films so I think this will just kind of give a lot of people more weight in making their own VR movies. So that's cool. Yeah, I think I think in, if nothing else, it's a headline. It's a good headline uh, that people can sort of um, see uh, sort of in the mainstream. It's more of like a mainstream kind of thing, I guess, that this um, from the Sundance Film Festival, a VR project is, is received this. So I think that's that's all good news. Um, the other thing, a uh, small news story, and this is to do with Fallout 4 VR. So... There has been, I think, originally when it was released, I think a couple of weeks afterwards, we did hear word that there would be a patch coming at some point in January. And it has been confirmed now. So um, there was a tweet that was... Um, somebody tweeted out who works at Bethesda, but then also there was a post on Reddit as well where they said that there will be a update for Fallout 4 VR um, in a like a beta branch of of that game, um, so you can try that out. I don't know. Um, let's just have a quick look on this. I think it's within the next week or so. Is yeah, that they right? said they um, the 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 copy I saw was from Jess. She cop she posts a lot on on Reddit and the relative forums. But she said that uh, the next update will start as a Steam beta next week. I'll also have patch notes ahead of the beta starting, so you can see what to expect. Those will be posted here for your visibility. Thanks again. And then she came back and edited the post and said, "And scopes, woo." Um, so uh, scopes was a was a big thing that people were looking forward to um, or was looking forward to being fixed because right now if you if you have a rifle and, and you can't really hold it up to your eye and, and get that pass through the lens um, uh, visibility I, hell I don't even know because I know scopes were broken I haven't even tried to snipe I've, I've, I've kept to using my pistol when playing the game but um, I know it's a, that scopes are a big big uh, point and then just any general fixes hopefully they can figure out a way to make the DLC compatible if you already own the base version of the game or maybe they can do something to improve performance because god knows you know um that game could could run a little better yeah 
Okay, well, I guess we can get on to the games that we've been playing this week. That's pretty much all the news we wanted to cover in this episode. It's going to be a slightly shorter episode, um, but we there is one big game and we've got a couple of others that we want to talk about as well the main one um we want to go through is the impatient so this is quite a big release for psvr last week this is from supermassive games um now before we got our hands on this there were reports coming out you know it's only two hours long and that kind of stuff and it's a 30 pound game 40 dollar game so people were a little bit disgruntled about the fact that you've got to pr- play uh, pay that high price in order to play a two-hour game um well, let me go over to Steve first. I know you've played uh, through this. What do you think? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> that's a that's a that's a it's a double handed sort of um, uh, compliment. I'm going to give this game. Like, like on one hand, I I, I truly like the game, and, and as you say, I have not only have I played it, but I completed it. Uh, and one reason I was able to complete it because you know I don't have a lot of time these days. I'm I'm very busy on a couple of work projects, so my time in VR is limited. And I was still able to complete this game on release week because it's so flipping short. This is a forty dollar title, and um, you know I, I didn't get to it until yesterday, and I was able to basically beat it in a day. Uh, and I, I did about two and a half hours is my runtime. I didn't time it exactly, but it aligns with what a lot of people on Reddit were saying. So at a high level, my my take on the game is is that. I really liked it, but I also liked Until Dawn. I thought Until Dawn: Rush of Blood was just a a, a very fun arcade shooter with it with a good skin on it, you know, within the Until Dawn universe. Um, so I liked the game, but in terms of like a recommendation or anything like that, I'm gonna say hold. Like I think as a ten dollar game, as a fifteen dollar game, which this will eventually become, you know, it might take a while, maybe September, October, but at some point you will be able to buy the impatient for ten, fifteen bucks on on some sort of sale. And at that point, I think it becomes a fantastic value. Right now, I'm giving it a, a definite hold on forty bucks because I do not feel that I got my forty dollars worth. That said, assigning the dollar to value value ratio aside i i did like the game but that's also because i have a vested uh time into the until until dawn franchise i really enjoyed the the main title before you know commercial vr was available um i like horror i like a really narrative slow paced uh games that that uh, of this nature so it speaks to me um but there was also a lot broken with it like it felt like and I'm, it, it, I don't want to speak in, in any sort of spoilery sort of way, but it felt like at times there it was just they it was, it was sort of just like a demo that they that, that they fleshed out and made into a game in a way like it was you, you spend the first, I don't know, 45 minutes or so of the game sort of in one room and you don't really get to open up and do any real walking or any explore exploring until after that time has passed and then even when you get to that point it's 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 very much just walk down a corridor and and just do what they've scripted for you which isn't inherently bad with but there wasn't a lot of of jump scares there wasn't a lot of of meat to the bones like the foundation i think was good um there's a lot to like and dislike but like it just seemed like a lot of wasted opportunity as well like they could have done so much more this is not anywhere near as good as until dawn uh but it's still overall like in the grand scheme of vr like i was able to play it for you know and knock it out in a day so i did enjoy it enough that that after 30 minutes i wasn't like screw this game take the headset off and, and never boot it up again so it's good enough to play um but but at the same time it's frustrating because this game could have been so much better yeah, I, I don't have a big problem with, with short games or anything like that, but the price really does need to reflect the, the, the amount of time, the amount of content that you're going to get out of the game. So I guess from that point of view, you know, I'm, I've got a busy schedule, I'm, I've got a family, I've got work and this kind of stuff. So if a game is sort of five hours long, I don't really mind that. That doesn't bother me, but I do think the price needs to reflect that. First impressions of this game for me were were pretty positive um, initially. I think the graphics do look very, very good. Um, you can see that from all the trailers and, and knowing what Supermassive have done in terms of like Until Dawn, the graphics in that particular game were very good as well. Um, also, sound was one of the first things that, that stuck out to me. I think they've done the sound very well, the 3D audio in this. I, th- I think it worked very well. Um, once I had got into the game, I did feel like the scale was wrong. Um, I don't know any better way to put it than that. And 
I looked into this and people were saying how you need to adjust the IPD on the PSVR and this kind of stuff because apparently IPD adjustment on the PSVR will directly affect world scale. I I don't know if this is true or not because I went in and I tried it from 61 millimeters IPD and I went all the way up to around 72. It didn't seem to make any difference at all in terms of scale. However, I, you know, I've, I've looked into this and there are some sort of reliable sources that do claim this this to be true, that, that the IPD adjustment in PSVR does affect the, the scale of the game. Leaving that aside, because I, I tried this, it didn't make any difference. Did you play with move controllers, Steve, or did you play on DualShock? I played with move controllers. I didn't even try it with DualShock because I read that it was sort of equally um, limiting. Yeah, I... I actually found it better with DualShock. I tried it initially with move controllers. And one of the things with move controllers, I don't know if you found this, Steve, again, this is all coming down to really the, like the scale problem that I had with this game is if, so say in, in real life, I've got my move controller in front of me and then the hand represented in VR is, is sort of where the move controller is when it's directly in front of me. If I raise the move controller up, it's almost as if like the, my hand is accelerating away. Now, it's not one-to-one. -one. It doesn't feel like my hand is actually, wherever the, the position of the move controller is, it doesn't feel like it's one-to-one -one with where my hand is in real life um, or the hand is represented in VR. And this was a big problem. I, I really didn't like this aspect of it. Well, they, it, it seems like they, they really tied a lot. They wanted you to have a body, right? So the whole time in this game, you look down, you have a chest, shoulders, arms so they wanted you to have a body as opposed to being floating hands and i can respect that but it seems like they didn't quite get that working uh so a lot of the locomotion like if you well i, I don't know how it was for the dual shock so i'll be interested in that feedback but but playing with a move controller turning like i could just turn in my space but it wanted to keep the forward based on the way my body was pointing. So if I was facing the camera as I am now, and then I turn 90 degrees and then press the move button, I still walk the way I was originally facing the camera, not, not the way I'm facing. So they sort of have this decoupled locomotion where you're decoupled from the headset view and also decoupled from where your, your hand is pointing, which is interesting because that's one of the things like I always kind of struggle with like, okay, I don't like, I don't like my movement coupled to the headset because I want to be able to, you know, look around as I'm walking. So, it's, but at the same time, I also think locomotion that's coupled to wherever the hand is pointing is also kind of bullshit. So, so, yeah. so they got around that, but it just created this whole other third problem <laughs> in the sense that 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 you can't freely turn in your play space. You have to actually turn with the in-game controls. So I was battling that quite a bit. So I'd be very curious how the DualShock stacked up against that. I preferred the DualShock far more playing this game, and and even that has its problems. It's not it's not ideal. I don't want to stick on um, the controls because they are frustrating. I think if you use move controllers or if you use the DualShock, there, there's a certain level of frustration on both of them. To be honest, um, I played until dawn, and, and I really really enjoyed that game when I played it on uh, PS4. And but and and this game really going into it, I knew the kind of game that I wanted this to be, and really it did fulfil that part of it. It's a lot of people will say, you know, this is it's barely a game, but and and that's true. But you know, until dawn had a very similar kind of um, way of gameplay mechanic. Really, you're just sort of going through and you're making these decisions. It's a narrative experience. It's, it's more of an experience than a game, I would say. Um, but that's okay. I was expecting that, and that that's fine. Um, with the um, just just going back to the graphics quickly as well, I felt like the environments were very dark, like overly dark, more dark than they needed to be in some cases, um, to the point of where in the PSVR you've got this um, because these screens don't cope well with sort of dark spaces you've got this mu um, is it mirror effect something like that it's yeah it's it's mirror which i think is basically just not every pixel can be perfectly lit to the same intensity so you get the this look of spec of you see the little spectacles you see each yeah. pixel yeah yeah so that really was prevalent in this game and it's okay you know it's the limitation of the hardware i guess to, to a certain extent more more so but i'd rather w when i played through this i was going back to resident evil 7 and everything is lit actually quite well in that game even even the dark areas seem don't seem quite as as bad as they do in this game and i think i wish they'd have lit the game better i'd, I'd some better lighting in, in certain areas and um, because it's sort of overly done i don't want to um 
give any spoilers away but there's a lot of what you mentioned originally steve about the walking through corridors okay the second half of the game really you're you're following people through corridors for a majority of the time and honestly it feels at points where they've tried to extend the gameplay to the point where you're just following people for extended lengths of time and doing nothing else there is almost i I mean i'm sure there are little diversions that you can make in order to get trophies and that kind of stuff because i did sort of veer away at one point and got a trophy from um that so there are probably hidden hidden parts in that but if you're following the narrative structure of this game you are going through and you're following people down corridors for a vast majority of it it's 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 really annoying after a while to be honest um the the final thing for me, I don't know. Did you play after the credits, Steve? After you um after it went through all the the credits at the end of the game, it had just a very very short, like about a one minute section, um where no, it sort damn of leads. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did no, I turned it's, it off. If you've played until dawn, then it's probably a good idea to go back and play that because it, it just it just it's hardly anything, but it just leads nicely into the until dawn game as well and i thought that was quite clever the way they've done that it's almost it's a little bit like a cheap trick really because they brought it all together but well i think uh, i know well, well. i think i know what you might be talking about no i did not do that and i think it, depending on the outcome that you got and, and i'll ask you after we close the show just so i know but depending on the outcome that you got you there there are tie-ins I, and i went ahead after i completed it uh because i know i'm not going to go back and replay the game uh looked at what some of the other outcomes were the different endings and, and, the, and the different uh branches from the the, the the decisions and choices that you make and um in general yes I, I think i know what you might be referring to but but overall i do think the game does tie into the until dawn universe pretty well like I, I found myself there was a, more than one location where i distinctly remember visiting in in the original until dawn game uh the church thing for one but then there was this one room where um you, you visit it and it's got a light in it. it's relatively dark it's after you're able to explore the hallways but in the original until dawn game that's where the uh the the the, the male teenager has to cut his hand off or his fingers off like I'm, I, I vaguely remember it but you have to make that choice in the original game and you're in that room again and i distinctly remember that room and i thought that was pretty cool uh having having that that tie-in uh but because at the same time there weren't any real revelations in this game like they didn't open up any any new narrative it was it was more or less kind of reliving the narrative that you already knew like you got some more detail because you were living that narrative uh but yeah. the, the overall and, and this isn't spoilers but the overall f- story of until dawn is is you know the miners become the wendigos and that li- leads to everything that happens and and there's nothing new to see here like it's kind of you already know that from having played until dawn so uh, that was a little bit of a letdown that there wasn't a little more exploration in the story. And again, I feel like I'm harping. I'm, I'm, I'm going over negative, over negative, over negative uh, about this game. Uh, but I still think it's a worthy experience. I enjoyed my time with it. Uh, I just not at 40 bucks. No, yeah. definitely how, not. How, like just, just coming from Wilson's heart, how, I mean, it sounds like it's completely different, basically. Like, is it not even comparable at no. all? No, For Wilson's me, heart's much better. Yeah, it okay. is, yeah, yeah. It's not it, uh, for me. I mean, I I can't recommend this game uh, at the price point it is at the moment. And honestly, I'd, I think it would need to be like a, about a third of the price in order for me to recommend it. It's um, it was disappointing. I'll be honest. It's it's not something that I think I'll be returning to. And it is a game that could potentially warrant some kind of multiple playthroughs. And I guess that's how they're justifying this price to some extent. But the decisions you make, the butterfly effect decisions you make, are few and far between. And I don't know how different the actual overall experience of that game would be playing through it multiple times i i have no inclination to go back and play through it again um it was an okay experience but it's definitely not worth that amount of money i don't want to be too negative on it at the same time i know i am being but um super massive games are, d- are doing some great work in in other areas so um rush of blood you know I've, I've started playing that a little bit on my psvr as well a fantastic game this is a completely different kind of game. Um, I just don't think it quite pulls it off, unfortunately. Correct. No, one, one last point I want to make, and I, I ask your, your take on it, Gary, is how do you feel about it in terms of actually being scary? Like the, the few parts of it were scary, but it seemed like they were really far in between. I can only recall off the top of my head maybe two or three uh, jump scares, but like, like Russia Blood like had more than that in the first damn level. 
Well, the second yeah. level, the pig level. The first one's more of a tutorial level. And like I feel like like you got this two and a half hour experience. They could have thrown a lot more fear at you. Um and they didn't. Like I, I was I was pretty let down by that. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, the um I agree. I mean, I there were probably two or three jump scares in this. And you know, it, it shouldn't have this over reliance. I don't think any VR game should have this over reliance of jump scares in order to make the experience valid as a horror experience. And I think the best ones don't rely on that. They rely more on the subtlety of horror and the just this over this unease, this sense of unease. And I think games like Chair in a Room did this extremely well. Um, and this is where, honestly, I think this is another point where the impatient falls down. It's it's not really that scary when I when I was playing through it. it really didn't feel that scary to me. Um, and that's okay because some people won't want that. They can get through the game, but um, it did it did fall down in that for me. And part of it, the re- part of the reason I think it didn't feel particularly scary to me is I had this. I couldn't really get immersed into it because of the frustrations I was having with the controls initially. Um, and I think anything that pushes you away in terms of immersiveness just makes you feel like because you don't feel like you're really there or you're really experiencing any of this stuff, the horror has less impact. Um, but even if I can take that out, out of it and look at it sort of uh, objectively from sort of taking a step back i still don't think it was a particularly scary experience in terms of jump scares or the overall ambience of it either yep and okay. last lastly I'll, I'll say one more i said last thing but but, but it just now came to me with the video that i'm playing um did you use the voice control we didn't talk about the voice con- commands at all and, and, and until dawn just for those that haven't played it, it it's a, it's very um narrative as we've said but it's also you know you'll be at a point where you got to make a a conversation or a dialogue choice between a and b and what you decide can change you know sort of what happens in the game and you can get different outcomes and, and so on we, we, we've seen that before uh but in the impatient because Supermassive knows that everyone playing the game has a microphone on and right there they enabled uh, voice and I don't remember if the original Until Dawn did that. I'm guessing no. I don't remember ever trying it but uh, I did go ahead and enable voice uh, commands and I think if the game had been a little better and I was super immersed that I would have used the voice commands more but outside of that it kind of felt like the early days of Siri and it was just kind of <laughs> yeah. like, like it was just kind of like uh, I didn't really like you know, I was just reading what was on the screen as opposed to just pointing at it and clicking. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I did use it initially for only for about the first 10 minutes. And then I, I decided to move away from that. I didn't really um, offer anything to me in terms of immersiveness. I, th- I guess what they're because they are trying to do that kind of stuff, I suppose, in order to immerse you more in this world. And that makes sense. It's it's an interesting experiment to do. It just didn't really I, I didn't like that that way of playing at all, really. But. Okay. Um, Chris, um, have you got anything you want to speak about this week that you've been playing? Um, I mean, not really. Like, it's all stuff we've played. I, I went on uh, the next game we were going to talk about a Smithsonian Journey Tour of Venice. Uh, I didn't go too far into it because I just looked at it. And I'm like, oh, this is a not very good 360 video. <laughs> like, I just looked to my left and the boats were all mismatched and not uh, parallaxing correctly. So I'm just like, eh. I don't, I mean, if, if I was into looking at Venice, I'm sure I'd like this, but just from face value of it being a 360 video, I didn't like it, but that's like, honestly, all I can say about that one. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I agree. I think, um, it was a little bit disappointing for me. I, I wanted to go into this because, um, my wife and I, we went, uh, to Venice on our honeymoon, um, back years ago now um, and I loved it it's one of my favorite places I thought it was a fantastic place um so I really was interested in, in going into this but yeah it's the same old story isn't it you know 360 videos it's stereoscopic 360 but it, it's like you say Chris it wasn't parallaxing properly and the resolution still low and yeah just uh, it's disappointing I think what they've got the idea they've got there is is good and it's sound but it's the technology just really isn't there to, to make it an interesting experience at the moment like yeah. like you i um I, I was in venice earlier this year and uh it was well earlier last year it's it's now 2018 but i was in venice like seven months ago eight months ago and i um you know so all this stuff was fresh in my mind so i didn't even know this was coming you had you had, had mentioned it gary and I, I quickly checked it out because uh, yeah i was just there like let's do this and i i think it was 
I think like, like to Chris's point, I think it was sort of um, underwhelming or something wrong with the video. Like we, we all know 360 video and VR is kind of like, it's, it's a little bit janky. Not, most of the time it doesn't feel quite right. Uh, but in this one, it felt like wrong. And almost like if the stereoscopic view was a little squeezed too much, like it felt like it was actually um, uh, like fatiguing to try to watch. Like it, it wasn't comfortable. Like it hurt me, not hurt, but it kind of, you know, was like, I don't know how to say what I, I was uncomfortable, like physically uncomfortable yeah. to try to watch it. And, uh, but that aside, like, I think, um, you know, when you, when you boot it up and you can actually back out to a view of the globe and they show another area, I already forgot what it was. I want to say it was somewhere in Africa, but they show another area that they're saying that says coming soon. So I think they're trying to tie this all in together where you'll be able to choose spots, almost sort of like Google Earth, and then get this this educational experience. So what they're trying to do, I think, is fantastic. And, and there's a lot of content here. I didn't click on every scenario, but you can do uh, several gondola rides. You can do a, a lot of uh, vantage points in the um, uh, San Marcos square um and then there's some along the walking path of various popular basilicas and and things like that that are that are in venice so i think there's a lot of content here it was, it was a 19 gig download uh so i think what they're aiming for i think is absolutely fantastic the the execution and the video itself uh they're clearly learning and then i think next go around they'll, they'll make it better um so I look forward to that being being better. Uh, but it's, you know, if you've been to Venice or if you have any uh, Italian curiosity, like maybe you're going to go to Venice and you want to plot out some things that you should check out, this like will help with that. It's worth doing. But outside of that, don't expect the, the stereoscopic video to look that pleasing or for there to be anything miraculous there. Yeah, if it was like my Ubi, I think it'd be amazing. But yeah, <laughs> nothing can be like my Ubi for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, that oh, was yeah. really good. That was especially good. Um, just to quickly mention on that Smithsonian Journeys tour of Venice, it's available on the Oculus Store and it's free. So everybody can give that a try um, if you want to do so. Um, so I want to get on quickly to Primordian. Steve, Chris, I think you've both had a chance to try this. Anthony and I spoke briefly about it last week. Um, what did you think of this game, Chris? Uh, man, it, it looks really good. I think, yeah, like I, it, it looked insanely good. Just walking through like the forest and stuff was incredible. Like it, it felt like it feels so cool being on an alien planet. I feel like there hasn't been that much of that in VR compared to what there could be. Um, for me, the combat wasn't very good, but just the environments themselves are really what what sold it for me. And I didn't play too much of it yet, but the environments did, did leave an impact on me enough that I want to keep playing it for sure, just to kind of see where it goes and the different environments. Um, yeah, you go did, ahead. Did you um, think like the combat, although, I mean, I completely agree with you. I think in terms of combat, it's... It, it, doesn't do the perfect job or anything like that but it does i mentioned last week it does make you feel like a bit of a badass in in terms of like the damage you can do to these enemies one thing i want to ask um both of you actually um i need to revisit vanishing realms now because to me that still excels in terms of its combat not in every single way but just the fact that you feel like you have agency in terms of blocking these attacks and that kind of stuff. And I feel like when, whenever there's a game that doesn't quite do do that, um, Primordium being one, I don't feel like my um, specific movements make any particular difference to the attack that I'm doing within that game. Whereas I do feel like that in Vanishing Realms. And maybe I need to revisit that. In my mind, that did it pretty well, um, but I've not played it for a long time. So may maybe I'm, I'm just uh, distorting that in my own mind. What, Steve, what do you think of this in terms of combat? No, I, I have the exact same um, in your mind uh, thought that, that with with Vanishing Realms. The combat here in Primordian is is almost non-existent. Like, and and I think you know, I think we got to be we we got to state something. And, and well, I'm gonna state something. You guys jump in if I'm wrong. But if if what I recall correctly from several of our emails and stuff, the developer did give us a key to this game, so we did not pay for it. Uh, but it's it's one guy making this, right? Like, am I remembering that correctly? I believe so. Um, I'm not 100 percent on that. I, but, I believe, uh, yeah, I believe we'll we'll double check. So so don't don't be too harsh in the comments. But I believe it's one guy making this, which is is incredibly like like mind blowing. But it is one of the best looking games. Like right now, I can't 
tell you in any sort of absolute terms a game that I think that looks better. And it's not just resolution or or uh, it's it's the world that has been created, the vegetation. Like you're walking through this jungle and you see this giant snake, although you never see its head, you only see its body coiling around these trees, and you see this giant spider-like creature. Like it is an, an incredible looking game. Uh, and I think they focused on creating the world first and, and have gone back and is now working on the combat. Uh, I do know there's more content content coming. Uh, they're going to flesh it out and make it a longer game. But it's the, the combat itself, to get to your question, Gary, is it's it's the 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 movements the swinging of the swords the the enemy combatant movements they all look good um where it falls apart is there is no meat to the combat in the sense that you can sort of do it uh, uh nintendo wii style where you just kind of stick your wrist out and waggle your swords your swords are uh completely weightless and you can just you know um just kind of just literally do that stick your hand out and you'll hit them 37 times in in two seconds um uh, so that's real real sort of broken in that sense and and i didn't see a way to parry like you can tell when the enemy is going to strike and and it gives you a good cue for that uh and you can get out of the way but i didn't see any way to sort of parry the strike or counter attack or do anything that would really flesh out that combat whereas in vanishing realms i do specifically remember that sort of stuff you have a shield and the enemy has a shield if you hit them on their shield it kind of does nothing whereas in primordian you can just kind of stick your hand through their shield <laughs> and then hit them on the other side so it is it is a bit flawed in, in in that sense, but I think where it shines is is graphically because in right now on the spot without really uh, researching it and planning ahead, I can't think of a game that looks better. Yeah, and I, I want to be fair to this. I don't want to stick on the combat for too long because for me the combat is the main downside of this game. Everything else is done very very well. I think the um, the presentation of it and as you say, Steve, the graphics look great. Um, and you know it, it guides you through it's a linear experience it guides you through this experience i think it does it very well um and also you know this game at the moment it's an early access game so it's 18 pounds 99 or 24 dollars 99 by stone punk studios and what they've said this developer did email us about this game so this initial part for this early access is just two hours long it's the first part of the story but there will be parts two three and four will be added onto this story so this could potentially be quite a big game in the end um so if this kind of game you know it's like a, a linear narrative sort of quite bare bones narrative at least the part i've played so far um combat game which is very very good so i don't want to i don't want to just be negative on this because it's it's a very very good game and i'm hoping that as the early access progresses they'll get better um combat sort of implementation in there as well i'm sure they can uh, do things to to fine tune it yeah um just just one thing like that annoyed me uh, this kind of immersion breaking for me that i feel like they need to fix is just like you know when i saw that giant spider thing i just started walking through trees with the trees not falling and i don't know there's just stuff like that that i'm just like ooh, if i didn't look at that i would have been way more immersed i don't know there's just certain certain things that aren't polished yet but i'm i'm hoping that they can eventually get to that yeah, yeah. There are certain things that you can point to. I think as, as we go through this and you can see things that, that just need refining slightly, I still think as an early access game, it's not one of these ones where it's just been thrown out there and it's early access and it's very unpolished because it's not that kind of experience. There are certain things in there, I agree with you, that, that are not quite right. Um, but some of the spectacle as well, like the, the snake, um, the huge snake that's going around the forest, that looks uh, great as well. Okay, Um so we've talked about that. Let's talk about Light Tracer. Steve, I think you've played this as well. I've played um, a little bit of this very briefly, so I won't spend too long on this. Maybe we'll get back to it another week. But um, for me, so this is a game um, by Void Dimensions. It's being published by Oasis Games, and it's coming out on the Vive, Rift, and the PSVR. Um, it's £11.39 or $14.99. So this is like a, a little puzzle game, really, Um you're presented with this world where you have to um, use this kind of like a, a magic wand where you point a, a, a piece of light at the ground and then this this girl will follow the place where you're pointing this light and you have to uh, navigate her using this method in order to get through these levels and the, obviously there's various ob obstacles and things like that in there. Um, I think the game looks great. It looks very good. Um, 
you know, it's there's not a lot to say in terms of um, the game as a whole because it's just a, a, quite a small puzzle game, I'd say. But um, I enjoyed it for what it is. It reminded me in some ways, and you know, I I, I quite like this game, The Hoops and Dragons. Um, it's a game that came out a long time ago. Some people didn't particularly like that, but I thought it was good, and my daughter loved it. It's just a, a very simple kind of puzzle game, and this one reminded me of that game in some ways. I think my daughter would love this one as well. It's not really the kind of game I'd spend any time in it all um steve what did you think i similar to you i quite liked it um i I found that i played it for for quite a while i think i mean it wasn't five hours or anything like that but i I played it i think for at least an hour which um i don't do if i don't like a game so um i think you described it it's it's very basic there there didn't seem to be uh, as far as i got much of a narrative or anything like that but it's uh, i played it on playstation vr i know it's available on steam as well um i don't know where you played it gary but uh, i played it on playstation vr and and like you say you just you 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 grab your motion controller you point and and the little princess will will follow the the trace that you made it's called light tracer and, and your beam is is looks like it's yellow looks like it's made of light so uh it kind of makes sense within the name but you gotta you gotta navigate her through these little uh three-dimensional worlds um that are that are very very basic it's a it's a platform where you there you can jump um or, or tell her to jump you know you just press the x button and she'll jump and 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 go over gaps and you gotta avoid enemies and you gotta figure out things and there was actually a little um boss like battle that, that I went through it took me a little while to beat that uh, from a difficulty curve and I don't know if it's just because I was early on um, there didn't seem to be a limit uh, you could just die over and over and over and over and it just kind of places you right there where you died so there's uh, I quickly learned to play sort of um, free of risk like I was just going at it like I, I never once felt like I had to conserve lives or do anything so I started dying quite a lit quite a lot because I just kind of wanted to move through the train fast uh, but I think it's also targeted somewhat uh, for for a younger audience it's a game that, that your children can pick up and play uh, it's presented real cute I think it looks really really good um, price wise it is uh, $14.99 it's developed by Void Dimensions and published by Oasis Games uh, and they, they did give us a key so so you know the disclaimer there we didn't pay for it uh, and, and I think um, I haven't showed it to my kids yet or to my son particularly but I think he'll enjoy enjoy it um it's got a good mechanic and i'm showing it in the video now of where you can actually grab the world and zoom in zoom out pull it up pull down to change your vantage point to kind of see um and it seems to also have a sort of a sharp uptick in difficulty like once i got first the first chapter where it it teaches you sort of how to play the game. The next chapter, they had enemies that were throwing boulders at me and the boulders were kind of rolling down the path and the the difficulty did seem to ramp up quite a bit. So I, I think it's a, I think it's a good game at, at 15 bucks. It's, it's sort of in the, um, uh, mobile kind of territory. I mean, well, I guess maybe that's expensive for a mobile game, but it, it kind of fits in, in that genre. I could see this being something uh, absent the motion controller aspect, something that you could play one day on like an Oculus Go uh, or something like that. Um, so all in all, I think I liked it for what it is. Yeah, there's there's a lot to like about it. Um, it's just not something that I'll be spending a lot of time in. But like you say, I think for, for my kids, I think they, they didn't get a lot out of it. Um, okay, the last one uh, we've got to talk about this week. Steve, do you want to talk about a handful of Keflings? Keflings. Sure. Uh, so, handful of Keflings is Keflings. Keflings, I think. Um, is it Keflings? <laughs> I, I, hell, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I probably should should have that sorted out. But apparently, this is a game like I personally never played it, but it has a uh, I don't want to say a cult like following, but it is a a game uh a universe a created thing that that a lot of people are aware of and and i believe this game was announced and and then released in in its current version relatively fast without a lot of people knowing about it um so when i did research on the game i I felt a lot of people saying like holy crap there's a kelflings game in vr like i didn't know that it makes me want to get vr right now uh so i i went on youtube and looked at some of the earlier games just to kind of see you know how they might compare but in vr what this game is is it's a it's a build them uh, I, 
I hesitate to call it a strategy game, um, even though it's got strategy like aspects. I, I didn't see what necessarily the goal was. Uh, initially, graphically and the vibe, it felt a lot like Tethered, which is a game that I liked a lot on PlayStation and eventually came out to PC VR. I think you can pick it up on Steam, both for the vibe and the rift. But in Tethered, you you have levels, and and your goal uh, is to get so many spirit points, and then you complete the level. And then there's different ways you can do that, and you can be graded. In, in various categories. In this game, in Handful of Keflings, I didn't see necessarily what the objective was. It seemed like the objective was just to keep building and building and building and building ad infinitum. Um, so that aside, the actual building process w w was fun. Uh, it, it was a lot of, like any game of its nature, it's a lot of micromanaging resources. You gotta have have the little Keflings, they look like little elves. You gotta have them chopping wood, uh, uh, mining stone, uh, uh, you know, you can refine the wood into planks and refine the stone into cut stone. And then you use those resources to build more buildings, build more homes. When you build homes, you get more calflings. You can give them jobs. And it's just kind of, uh, you know, it's like a little uh, economy. It's, 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 I guess it's like how, how any country works, right? You, you give jobs and you build homes and you get more people and more jobs. Uh, and and um, all that, that is fine. Uh, but my big takeaway and is is that I didn't see the purpose. Like, what was I building to? Like, when did it end? And, and I played for like 45 minutes and it just didn't seem like it was gonna end. Uh, so in that sense, I, I don't, didn't necessarily like it, but outside of that, I thought it was cute. It was cartoony, it looked good. Uh, the building aspects, all of that was fine. A lot like Light Tracer in the sense that I think it could um, be something that kids could probably pick up relatively soon. It, it wouldn't be anything for a real young child because uh, it is advanced enough in that sense but something around like an eight to 10 year old could probably pick it up and do pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Um, well, is anybody got anything else that I've missed off here that they want to talk about at all? Uh, I'm mm -hmm. double checking. I don't think I have anything on the list. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess that's it then. So it's a little bit uh, lighter this week in terms of news. Um, so hopefully, you know, over the next few weeks, I'm sure we'll start uh, getting some more announcements and that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, thanks for joining us on this episode. This was episode 69 of VR Roundtable. Um, I'm sure Anthony will be back next week um, and we'll all see you next time. Uh, please like the video, uh, make a comment and, you know, if you can leave a review on iTunes or any other podcast service, that's always appreciated as well. So um, thanks for that and we'll see you next time. See you, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye.